what happens when we get to the end of our studies and we have to go out into the big bad world and start asking patients to pay us to treat them? So there's a lot of different models that you can do and a lot of different decisions to make and that's what this video is all about. Okay, so let's break this down into categories and the first thing you're gonna decide on is who are you gonna work with? Broad categories within that, do yourself, for someone else, all sorts of things like that. The second category is how is that gonna be structured? So you could work for yourself, for example, at home, in your garage, just not put a bench up and go for it. Or you could be doing it in someone else's clinic. And the third thing is location. So that can be broad. So are you gonna be in Australia? Are you gonna be in Canada? Are you gonna be in the UK? Within Australia, do you wanna work in the city? Do you wanna work rurally? So that's kind of broad. And then there's also kind of narrow. Do you wanna be located in a gym? Do you wanna be located in a midwife center, very different things, and give you very different avenues in terms of possibilities of patients. Okay, number one, who are you gonna work with? And your options here are working alone, so let's talk about that in a second. So you decide that you wanna go out and work on your own. Now the major disadvantage of that is that it's a lot harder to learn off other people because you don't have other people to bounce off. Now you may be deciding to work alone you know, in your own place at home, that's even more isolating because you don't even have people to kind of chat to in terms of, let's say you're working on your own, but in a gymnasium, even if they're not the same professor as you, it gives you the opportunity to bounce ideas off other people or simply to say, wow, I had this patient today and they were like, ah, oh, driving me nuts. Obviously, it's still confidential, you can't say details of that, but it gives you a little bit of an opportunity to kind of let go. So I would say if you do decide that you want to work on your own, then really you need to be the sort of person that is comfortable with that. You need to be a little bit of a loner. Now there's nothing wrong with that. There's a lot of qualities that I think loners have. I'm a little bit of that myself. It's kind of modulated over the years, but definitely I like my own space and I like my own company. So if you're like that, then you might really thrive on working alone, working at home. The great beauty of that is that you can control the environment, providing, of course, you're single, you don't have kids and, and you, you know, your partner, et cetera, et cetera. So there are certain kind of drawbacks to working at home as well, but it does give you a sense of control over the rent, you know, over not being kicked out and being able to stay somewhere for a long time, over, you know, who you talk to, who you interact with, all those sort of things. It might be control over noise, all of those type of things. So if that's something that you really like, then it may be an avenue that you want to pursue. However, overall, working on your own when you first graduate and when you first come out from moving from that student phase into paid practice, you're going to want to have, want to have people around you. You're in that situation where you've been able to discuss cases Every single case you have, you come out and you talk to the, the tutor about it and then you get guidance. Now, if you suddenly go cold turkey on that, then that is really difficult. Now, if you're working in a practice where there's other osteopaths around, then even though you can't maybe go out in every single case and say, oh, can you come and help me with this? You know in the back of your mind that if you get something really tricky, then you can go out and ask. And I remember a scenario where I'd only been in practice maybe, I think, well, probably six weeks, and I had a patient come in, and I can't remember what they came in for, it was a back pain or something like that, and I did my examination, I put my hand on their abdomen, as part of my examination, and I could feel this throb, 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 and I thought, ooh, that's, that's a bit weird, and I was just like, not sure about this, and so what I did is I went out and I got the senior osteopath, and I said, can you come in and have a look at this, I'm a little bit worried, and they put their hands on, and they palpated as well, and they agreed with me, there was something a bit weird going on. And we said to this patient, look, we'll continue with the treatment, and because it was safe to do that, I don't think I was working around there, perhaps I was working in their neck, and I was doing very gentle cranial work. And I said, but I really want you to go and see the doctor. I'm a little bit worried about how much this pulse is coming through as your artery here. Please go and see them. And I saw their wife came in for treatment about six weeks after that, and she said, I just want to really thank you because I can't remember the guy's name, but blah, 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 went off to the doctor and they had a problem there and they had an operation and this saved them. They had a dissector in aorta and it saved them from having an aortic aneurysm and possibly dying. And so that was a really good case because would I have had the courage to refer them 
or refer them as strongly as I did if I didn't have the backup from that senior osteopath. Because what happens when you first graduate, there's you haven't really grown into yourself yet. There's this element often of wanting people to like you and not be wanted to make a fool of, and you don't have the experience maybe. And so that leaves you sometimes a little bit vulnerable where you might refer someone but not insist as much. So I said, look, I think you should get this looked at. Yes, I'm referring him, but not as strongly. And then he doesn't pick up, but he picks up on the body language of me being maybe a little bit insecure, not quite sure of myself. And then he doesn't follow through and something bad happens. If you are super confident with your clinical skills, but more so super confident with your ability to follow through and really you know, have integrity in knowing through the, your whole body that you're just going to refer, boom, no problem, then that's a problem. You don't need that senior osteopath. You don't need that colleague to give you that little bit of confidence. But if there's any doubt of your mind, and for most of us there will be, then the benefit with working with someone else is actually really quite great when you start off. So that's one thing in terms of that safety. Now, the other aspect is in terms of actually being able to learn off people. Because if you are working on your own, then you don't have those people to bounce ideas off. Just chat to them at lunchtime, even in an informal idea, informal way. But also, in most clinics, I would encourage you that if you're going to work with someone else, and we'll talk about the different ways and structures that can happen, you can be employed, associate, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that what you actually do is find a clinic where you are going to get some formal mentoring. At least once a week or once a fortnight, you can sit down with more senior colleagues than you with more experience and go through cases, cases they have, cases you have, because the learning skills, sorry, the the learning speed you have, it's just going to accelerate so much. It's going to really give you that extra bit of experience from other people, but also the confidence to go back and do more things with your patients in maybe slightly different ways. And so your ability to learn accelerates. If your ability to learn accelerates, your ability to earn a living accelerates as well. If you're concerned about that and it's natural concern you know you graduated you have no student debt you might be thinking wow i need to get some dollars in here to pay that debt off and so the ability to learn quickly accelerates your earnings you know in the first year but also later on because you become a better practitioner faster so there's two aspects to the working on your own that you need to address if you're going to do that number one is that ability of confidence we talk about being safety and the number two is the learning Now, that doesn't mean you can't go out and work on your own because what you can do is you can structure learning. You can go on courses and that might be online courses because at the moment with COVID, you know, it's a little bit difficult to get the in-person stuff and we don't know how long this COVID thing is going to hang on. But also you might be in a rural setting and we'll talk about geography later. And so it's very hard for you to get to attendance courses or other considerations. You have family, you have commitments like that. And so you have to think through how you're going to do that learning if you're going to be working on your own. And that's one of the advantages of working with other people. And we're going to come on and talk about now the advantage of that and the disadvantages. One of the advantages is that you get some of that taken care of. It's almost like you're, you've got a parent that's kind of looking after you a little bit or should be if they're mentoring you. That's part of that mentoring role when somebody takes you on. And we'll talk about that now as we come on to the other structures. How do we break these down? These are working where you're in a clinic which is not kind of linked to your discipline or obviously you can work with someone else that is aligned with your profession. Now with both of those possibilities, you can just simply rent a room or you can do more than that and you can rent room and reception, you know, and then obviously the cost of that's gonna go up or you can become what we call is an associate. And so an associate is where you pay a percentage of your fee to the clinic owner. That clinic owner might be the same profession as you, or they might not. And okay, and there's one more as well, which is the employee. I think a lot of it is down to personality, to be honest. So for example, if you want less responsibility, then the employee role is really the one that's gonna suit you, where you just go into work, and you don't have to worry too much. You're still going to have to worry and have responsibility for your patients because they're your patients, you know, and you're caring for them. In that moment, you have complete care for them. You you might be employed, but the employee is employing you to take absolute control once you're in that treatment room. So you're still going to have that responsibility, and that's a major responsibility when you're working with patients. However, you know the employee is taking more of that responsibility 
off you in terms of they're paying your salary, they might be doing more of the marketing, they might be having a more structured mentoring role for you for your progression, stuff like that. And so if you like that idea of that burden being taken off you, then that's something that you might appeal to. Now coming down from that is the, then we have the kind of just rent a room. So here you are taking responsibility usually for all of your marketing, you're just renting a room. It might be in the same profession, it might not, but you're going to take responsibility basically for providing patients. And if no patients turn up, well, tough luck, you still got to pay your rent. If it's Christmas, if it's Easter, you go on holiday, you pay your rent. That's part of the deal. You are renting a room, you're not renting a practice, you're not renting a list. And so there's a little bit more responsibility that goes on there. So on one end, we have employee, and on the other end, you have just rent a room, and it's your responsibility to totally, totally to bring in the patients. Now, between those two extremes, we have the kind of associate, that, the associate role. And the associate role is that you agree to give a percentage of the take that you have from patients. So a patient comes in, and they pay you $100, and you might get $60 of that, $50 of that. You know, there's different percentages that you can negotiate, and that ranges generally from in the physiotherapy rule, a role where you can take as little as 30 or 35%. So you only get $35 in that 100, up to the highest I've ever heard is $70. So you get $70 of that 100. Now, if you're a new grad, then you're, you're not going to get 70%. I started on 50%, and when I finished as associate, I was on 70%. So it does vary. That 70%, I had to bring my own treatment bench, all my own uh, equipment in terms of clinic kit. I had to pay for my own stationery, business cards, all those sort of things. So there's different things and it varies. It's my cat in the background. It'll help it, helping us out. Hopefully not gonna make too much noise and rip a load of paper up. So there's various different models that we can have here and do that. Okay, sorry, I had to pause there for a moment. The cat, I had to put the cat downstairs. She was shredding the carpet, shredding everything else inside and also attacking the reformer. Okay, so we were talking about these percentages and 70%. So if you wanted 70%, what's your compelling argument for that? Well, your compelling argument might be that you produce a lot of patients for the clinic. Now that might be two ways. You might've been working somewhere for a long time and so that you're full now. You work somewhere three, four years and the number of patients that come in, you're absolutely full to the gunnels as with your list and the patients that ask for you can't see you and then will go to other practitioners. Well, that might be a compelling argument to say, well, I, you know, I'm deserving of 70%. Now, it's very different to a new grad that's coming in that bringing no patients with them. So there's different scenarios here. And so what we're looking at is that associate thing. We talk about at one end, we've got an employee, and the other end, we've got basically your own room and this range of responsibility. And then in this middle range is an associate. Now, that might be a new grad which no patients and needs a lot more mentoring. Well, that is one range of responsibility where the clinic owner is going to be doing a lot more for you. And then we move towards that more experienced practitioner that has their own list, doesn't need as much mentoring. So if you're coming out as a new grad and you're thinking about that associate thing, you really want to be going for, I feel, a clinic that gives you a lot of mentoring. It's going to be like a family. It feels like a family where you really feel held and supported and so if things aren't going right for you, they're not like, okay, you're out the door, you don't fit, let's get another one in on the production line. That, for me, is not a good way for clinic owners to be operating. Now, on the other side of the thing, you'll see that associates that don't behave particularly well either, and they're irresponsible in terms of what they do, in terms of not turning up or turning up late, or just the way they, they behave in terms of the clinic. And so it's a really a symbiotic relationship and it should be you know like a family that works well rather than a dysfunctional family and so if you're starting off in your career that's what I say you will look for and how do you look for that well when you go for interview people you talk to them and you ask them about you know can I talk to the other associates here and have a chat with them and see how it is you know and you do that in a way just so I can get a feel now any clinic owner that is happy with the environment will be yeah sure absolutely because they know those other associates are happy and are gonna tell you the same thing now equally it's talking to the owner seeing if you get on and then the clinic owner should be doing the same for you to see if you're a fit not just with your skills but with your personality 
And so that associate thing, I think, is a good model. But what are the disadvantages? The disadvantages are that you've got to find a clinic owner that I feel is ethical. And there are lots that are, but there are you know a few bad eggs like there will be in any kind of field. And equally, it's going to require of you a level of responsibility because you are more you know, more level of responsibility than if you're an employee because you're in somebody's business, but more than that, you're in someone's home. Very much, not literally their home, in the clinic, but when you're working in a clinic, someone's clinic, the clinic owner feels like this is their home, this is their, almost their place of worship somewhere because you you put so much into your work and this is not, not to knock stockbroking or banking or things like that, but it's a different kind of profession. There's a whole bunch of patients that we're supporting here. And if a clinic owner gives you a patient to look after, it might be someone that they've known for a very long time and they want them to be cared for. It's the same if you're an employee, but it's slightly different. It's just slightly different there. And so we have those different models. And you've got to choose individually what's best for you in terms of your level of responsibility. You've got to be honest with yourself and say, hey, look, and maybe I'm not quite as responsible as I will be in a few years' time, and so I need a little bit more guidance here, and so you've got to choose the role that's best for you. Now, for many people, not many people at all, for a few people that don't have insight into their own personalities, they'll be like, I'm super responsible, I'm super awesome, and I'm super brilliant, and I'm going to work on my own. Well, good luck to you, and if that's proved right, you will be a raving success. But Sometimes what happens is when the fat goes on the fire, you actually see the reality of stuff. And so sometimes what happens, you have to go down that route to realize that you weren't quite as responsible, weren't quite as skilled, and weren't quite as successful as you thought you were. But that's okay, because then you can then change route a little bit. So if you're watching this video and that you have done that route, that's fine. You just say, okay, well now I'm going to work in an environment where I get a little bit more support. Uh, a little bit more support, and that can be your way forward. You haven't done anything disastrous to uh, end your career as a practitioner, and you can move forward with that. So that's quite a long discussion of that because it is a really big topic, and we only just touched on it. But I want to summarize that for you and just say your decision, if you decide whether it's employee, associate, you know, and your own clinic or your own room, shouldn't just be on money. Because you might think, okay, well, I've got my, I'm going to work from home, which means I'm paying no rent. I'm not paying anyone a, a percentage. I'm going to get 100% of everyone that comes in. Well, that's a money decision. And then as an employee, an associate, there's other money decisions there. Now, there's two things to that. One is it can be short-sighted in terms of money because 100% of two patients is not a lot, whereas 50% of a lot of patients is a lot more. So you might actually find that that money equation doesn't work the way you think it does. But there's also the more long-term progression because long-term, if you think about money, you think about progression, the more skilled you are, the more you can charge. And that is basically a fact within any business. Now, yes, there's marketing, there's other factors as well, but you can be marketed, have a wonderful marketing system and all of this kind of wonderful advertising and if your product is not that great, i.e. your skill sets are not that great, then that is unsustainable. Consider your skills as well as consider your monetary situation because both of them are interlinked. And so you have to think carefully about that. And if you're able to, I would suggest, you know, put it on that back burner, trying to earn big bucks early on, you know, going for that dollar, because what will happen is it will probably just stall you in terms of earning the dollars later on down the road. And so there's many factors to consider in there, which moves us on to the next point, which is geography. Because whatever model you use within those, you work on your own, you work in a different clinic, if there are not patients coming in, then it's going to be hard to build your experience, it's going to be hard to earn your living. And so geography does play a part on that. So for example, if you go out to the middle of nowhere, you will have no competition probably, but you also may not have much awareness of the profession you're in. So, you know, there you can go places where they have no idea where an oste what an osteopath is, let alone a cranial psychotherapist. You know, acupuncture they might have heard of, but think it's really weird and they don't want to do that. So you have to consider the general geography. 
And you need to do your research on that because sometimes when you go rural, it's actually really good because there isn't any competition. Now that will be then starting up on your own and we have, we've already talked about the points of that and the difficulties in terms of getting uh, professional development and courses and things like that. But you may decide that you want that adventure. So you're gonna go out, you're gonna pioneer because after all, you know, people started osteopathy, AT still, he started, he didn't have anybody else to go and learn from. He didn't have anyone at a clinic to go and study with. He generated patients from nothing. And within 10, 20 years, they actually were building railroads to take patients to Kansas. That was how good he was. That was based on his skills and his insight. And he certainly wasn't kind of, if you like, going from scratch. He had a lot of life experience and a lot of insight and was an incredible person. But that doesn't mean that you can't do incredible things as well. You, you know, if you've got that confidence and that spark in you and you want to be a self-starter and you really want to go for it, then yeah, you go for it. You get out rurally and you you spread the word. You, you do the gospel in your thing that you're doing and people will come if, if you're that way inclined. But for many people, it's like, yeah, that's not the journey you want to do. And that's okay because at the moment, it's, the key thing at the moment is to recognize where you are in your life. At the moment, you're like, I want to learn my profession, learn more about my profession. I don't want to have to spend a lot of energy on creating patients. Well, that's telling you where you need to go. You need to be an employee or an associate in a clinic where patients are kind of come in. That's kind of telling you. That's narrowing your options straight away. Now, we're talking about geography. So you've got that general thing of geography. And there's a good saying in that a great practitioner can work anywhere. A Average practitioner has to choose a little bit more carefully where they work and someone that's not a very good practitioner has to be super careful where they work. And that's kind of obvious. So if you're brilliant skills, then you're gonna make it anywhere. You can go to New York, you can make it anywhere you like, and you're gonna build a practice. You're gonna see someone, someone's gonna come in and see you even if you treat them for free, and then they go, wow, this person is awesome. They're gonna tell someone else and it's gonna roll on, roll on, roll on, roll on. Now. If you don't have those skills yet, because you can develop those skills, that's what part of what we're talking about this is how you develop these skills. Then you're gonna to wanna to work maybe in a clinic where it's reasonably busy, so that's probably gonna be in the city or metropolitan or a rural center where there's gonna be patient numbers because there's a number of people in that, in that population. And it's gonna be an established clinic, so there's already people ringing. The phone isn't dead, it's not a new number. And so that's in terms of your general geography of where you want to be. Now, you also need to consider your family and your inclination in terms of what you do. Maybe you're single, you don't have family, partner, whatever, but you still might be able to like doing different things, surfing, going out to clubs, whatever. Well, you've got to consider that and be in an environment that you like. Now, that isn't always the case. Sometimes you're just single-minded. I moved to New Zealand. I didn't know anyone. I, my last clinic shift took... Two hours after the, my last clinic shift, I was at Heathrow Airport waiting for my flight to go to New Zealand via Hong Kong where I knew no one. That's just what I was. I was just like, I just want to learn from the best and that's what I want to do. If you want to do that, that's guiding your decision. Yeah. So you need to understand where you are to make decisions that's going to be right for you. So that's your general geography. Now localized, you also need to think about localized as well. So if you want to work with kids, then if you can work in a midwife's clinic, then that's going to be great. There's going to be a lot of kids and babies around. And it's natural then to have that kind of build. And it's also, you know, if you have kids and babies making noise in the clinic, well, that's okay. That's absolutely fine. However, if you want to work at sports, then obviously gym or something like that, or in a, you might want to go in with a physio that already specializes in that kind of thing. So these kind of things are kind of pretty obvious. You've got to go where the patients are that you wanna see. Okay, so a lot of stuff we covered. Now what you need to do is go and ask yourself some questions and answer those questions. And we got different categories. You've got category number one, who are you gonna work with? Is that gonna be on your own or is that gonna be someone else? Then you've got how you're gonna structure that. And we talked about the different options for doing that. So you're gonna have to think through all those different ones, associate, employee, work and rent in a room, all those different things. Rent a room, someone in the same profession, different profession. Then you're gonna to need to look at geography. Where do you wanna be? Where's this clinic gonna be? If it's your clinic, which clinic are you gonna work in? 
And those are three categories. There are lots of questions there. And then when you've written all those down or discussed them with someone, you don't necessarily write them down. Then there's a fourth category, and that is the, your intuition. Okay, and that is what you feel you want to do. And sometimes what happens if you go against your intuition, even though you've got all this logic, then you're just going to not feel right inside. And so sometimes it's a case of writing all this stuff down, asking, answering all these questions, and then like doing the opposite. And you're like, what the, where did that come from? And that is absolutely fine, providing you have done those questions and have considered those things. Because those things are going to come up and bring up issues for you. And go bring up things within your own psyche, within your own character. And if you still want to follow with this intuition, then one of two things are happening. Either it's true intuition, which is good on you, that your ability that you can feel that and you should follow it. The second one, it's not true intuition, but it doesn't matter because you have already dead set decided on this and nothing is going to stop you. In which case, you need to follow through on that. Otherwise, you're going to regret, you know, always you're going, I should have done that, I should have done that, I should have done that. You need to do that. Even though it's not true intuition, it might still work. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's not true intuition. It might still work. Hard work, luck, it might still work. And if it doesn't work, that's fine. You need to go down that road. So I hope that's of use to you. If you ask any questions, you feel free to ask questions of me. I'm more than happy to help this because this is a crucial area for you. We really put some thought in. The end message for you here is put some thought into this. Don't just willy nilly do something. You are going from a coddled environment where you've been two three years doing something now you're out into the unknown uh, i remember when i graduated the first time not osteopathy i was doing computer science and business i got a four-year degree every year da, 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 and suddenly it's like oh 21 oh my god what am i going to do for the next 70 years of my life it was incredibly frightening and so when you put some thought into this it allows you just to settle a little bit discuss things watch this video talk to other people and you get to this process of working through where you need to go, what your next step is. And if that step is to uh, comment and I can answer that or drop me an email, I'm happy for you to do that.